All right, Romans 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace. Just every time you read it, it's, it's remarkable. It's a blessing. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, praise God for that, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood. We talked about that blood Sunday night and Sunday morning. To declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. And so one more time, the Holy Spirit, just in case there, there's anybody left who still believes that people were getting saved by works before Calvary, and then the Lord decided to make it easier now than it used to be. He said the sins that are past were dealt with by the forbearance of God until they could be remitted by the blood of Jesus Christ. And it's very, very important that we know that and understand that. Look with me at two places to underscore this. Acts 17 and Hebrews chapter 9. Acts 17 and Hebrews chapter number 9. Let's pray again. Father, uh, thank you for the Bible and help us tonight, uh, Lord, not to just go through the motions of uh, looking at verses with our mind wandering off somewhere. Help us, God, to really take to heart the joy and the blessing of, of the things you've done for us. And we appreciate it and pray you'd help us in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Acts 17 and verse number 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens... I perceive in all things you're too superstitious. Brother Jake preached a message on that. I, I, it's got to be right after we moved in this building. And I, I, I've never forgotten his great, great look at that word superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions. Brother, next time you preach, you ought to preach that again if you still got the, the notes. We've, we've, or study it again see if you can find the same thing you did last time. But it, it was really good. And, and most of you weren't, weren't here to hear it then. We, uh, uh, I've started four churches in Deland. Uh, all under one roof. We just, <laughs> we start one, build it up, and then it goes somewhere. And we start another, build it up, and go somewhere. Anyway, thank the Lord he keeps sending in reinforcements. Praise the Lord, because the AWOL rate is pretty high. Um, anyway, Acts 17, uh, 20, uh, 23, for as I passed by and beheld your devotions, so they're devoted to their superstition. You got Christians that aren't devoted to Christianity, but you got you got superstitious pagan people who are devoted to their superstitions. That's why they're winning and we're losing. They have a greater level of devotion to falsehood than we do to truth. Nobody ever has to urge unsaved people to go to the movies or go to the ball game or go to the to the beach or anywhere else. They want to go there. But you've got to urge saved people just to go to church, much less get out and witness and do anything for the Lord. So anyway, uh, I beheld your devotions. I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. And it's, it's, uh, it's always polite for a preacher to say to religious people that they are ignorant. See, he said it politely. He said it with a smile on his face. He just had to tell them the truth. God that made the world. I mean, if you know who God is, let the people who don't know who He is know who He is. God who made the world and all things therein, seeing that He is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Neither is worship men's hands as though He needed anything, seeing He giveth to all life and breath and all things. Everybody breathing out there, God gave them breath. Everybody's alive out there, God gave them life. Everybody's got things out there, God let them have those things. And, but they don't, they don't give him much credit or glory for it. And it made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. You cut everybody, they'll bleed the same. It might look different on the out, outside, but they're pretty much the same on the inside. And it determined the times for appointed the bounds of their habitation that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him. Because, well, I just, don't, I just don't see God. I don't see you know, any evidence there, there's a God or... Are you looking for him like a blind man's looking for a home? If you don't see God, feel after him. If you feel after him, can't touch him, ask somebody to help you. 
And these people weren't ignorant because they didn't have any brains in their head. They were ignorant because they didn't want to look for God. They didn't want to find God. They were content to have an unknown God and, and, and vain superstition. Uh, they didn't want to be bothered with finding the Lord. But, but anyway, he said, uh, he said, you ought to seek him. And if, you, if you, that doesn't work, then feel after him and find him. That's God telling pagan, heathen, Gentiles, you could find God if you sought him. He's not hiding himself. You're just not looking for him. Come back, uh, back don't, don't lose the place here, but come back to Romans 3, which uh, you should know, you should be able to find that by now. <laughs> Romans 3, verse, verse 11, there is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. It wasn't that they couldn't seek after God, they just chose to go somewhere else. If they're all gone out of the way, then they're in motion, they're moving, they're looking for something. They're just not looking for God. Right. And so the Holy Spirit says through, through the apostle in Acts, in Acts 17, if you would seek God, if you'd feel after God, you could find him. And the reason you still think God's an unknown God is because you're not looking for him. He lays that right at their feet. All right, so verse number 17 goes on to say, uh, though he be not far from every one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as uh, certain also of your own poets have said, for we are all his offspring. Now, that's not Bible truth. That's what one of their poets said, and he quoted one of their poets and said, how can you have this number one song that you, you sing every time you get together, and, and you sing this song about we're all his offspring, and yet you don't know who he is? How can you say you don't know there's one God when your own famous poet of, of your people and your nation wrote a poem that you all know that said we're all his offspring? That's not a Bible doctrine that everybody's God's offspring. He's, he's preaching to his audience. You say you don't know who God is, and yet you, you sing this song and you quote this poem and your school children memorize it and say we're all the offspring of God. You don't say we're all the offspring of 12 different gods in the pantheon up there. So he's using their own culture as a witness against them. All right, 29. For as much then as we are the... It's kind of like you saying, how can you say you're an atheist when you say, oh my God, all the time? See, he's not... He's using their knowledge against them or for them, however, however you want to view it. All right, 20. Uh, 29, for as much then as we're the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. Isn't that a great argument? If you came from God, then God's not a piece of wood. He's like you. If you live and you move and you have being and you're God's offspring, then God lives and moves and has being. So why are you worshiping these dumb statues and these silly idols? He's reasoning with them, but uh, you can't get anybody saved if you don't knock the props out from under them. They're not going to repent of what they're doing unless you point out to them that what they're doing is, is unprofitable and vain. All right, 30. In the times of this ignorance, this is what we're trying to get to, God winked at. You know what that is? Forbearance. You know what that is? Long-suffering. He sees it, he knows it's going on, but he chooses to close his eyes to it. But now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. So what makes the difference between God dealing with sinners in forbearance and God saying, no more forbearance, I command you to repent right now? What changed? Verse number 31 because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given witness unto all men, in that he raised him from the dead. Do you know when the times of God winking at sin, God dealing with sin and forbearance, you know when they came to an end? When Christ died and was buried and rose from the grave. 
And now that Jesus Christ has made a payment for sins, God is not going to wink at sins anymore. He's not going to wait around and let you play in sin for a hundred years or a thousand years or two thousand years waiting for a way out. There is a way out. So now repent. That's what he said. Uh, there, are, there are Christians, they're Christians, brothers in Christ, they're my brothers in Christ, and they, they are opponents of the doctrine of repentance. And they, they go out of their way to make sure that you know that they're against the preaching of repentance. I will side with the Holy Spirit. I will side with the Apostle Paul. I will side with the Lord Jesus Christ. I will side with God. God commands all men. That's pretty clear. Everywhere, that's pretty clear, to repent. Now, if you say people don't have to repent, you're only wrong slightly. You're wrong with regard to all men everywhere. That's about as wrong as you can be. <laughs> if, if God says all men need to repent, what, what men? Uh, everywhere. And you say, I don't believe in repentance, then you're wrong as many times as there are men on the earth. That's a lot of wrong. So when somebody criticized me and said, now watch out for that guy Knox, he preaches repentance. At least I'm right about everybody on the earth. I mean, I, you could probably be more right, but that's, that's pretty close to being as right as you can be. If all men everywhere need to repent and I preach repentance, I, I think that's closer to the mark than all men everywhere are commanded to repent, and I say you don't have to repent. So we're, we're going to stick with, with repentance. Anyway, so notice, there was a time when God winked at sin, but when Christ rose from the dead, that time came to an end. So what marks the difference in the dispensation of God with regard to sins that are past? Calvary. Calvary. Not the giving of the law. Calvary, not the building of the temple, Calvary. Amen. All right, Hebrews chapter 9, we've read this a couple of times. We'll read it again, Hebrews 9 and verse number 15. Or, or no, let's, let's get to context. We're going to memorize some of these verses right, right this month as we go through Romans here. Um, 11, 9, 11 for Christ. Being come and high priest of good things to come by greater, more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. Praise the Lord. He entered him once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. We read that verse about redemption, and we read that verse about the blood. Keep going. For if the blood of bulls and of goats, the ashes of an heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifieth, purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, we talked about that Sunday, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, we talked about that when we covered propitiation, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God, we talked about that when we talked about the fruits or the benefits of propitiation, and for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament. They which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. How were people saved before Christ died on the cross? Quite honestly, they weren't. They died in faith and waited for a Savior to make a way for them to be saved. And the sins that were committed under... Now here's how God divides it. That testament, this testament. In, in God's reckoning in this verse, where's the dividing line? It's the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. When were the sins that were committed before the cross, when were they paid for so God could give those people redemption? They were paid for at the cross. Not before and not by any other means. By the cross. 
Well, I, I read a book one time, and it said that before Calvary, people were saved by keeping the law. Well, you can read a lot of things in books. But I just read you what this book said. And this book said, those transgressions were not paid for until Jesus shed his blood to pay for them. And that was, and that was their redemption. Now, uh, a couple of nice uh, young men uh, may come to your door here in the next few weeks or months. And uh, they're going to offer you another testament of Jesus Christ. That's what, what the Book of Mormon is called. Another testament of Jesus Christ. Let's read the next verse while we're in the neighborhood. Verse 16. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead, otherwise it is, is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Keep that verse. Come to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. Verse 17, Jesus says, remember Jesus died on the cross? Remember he rose from the dead? Here's what he said after he rose from the dead. Verse 17, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Okay? The only way the Book of Mormon could truly be another testament of Jesus Christ is if Jesus Christ had died a second time. Because you can't have a testament go into effect without the death of the testator. So we, Christ dies and we have a new testament. If he lives forevermore after that death, he dies, he rises again, he never dies again, then you never have another testament of Jesus Christ. The devil just, he'll let a guy start a religion, but God, God will not let him conceal the falsehood of that religion from anybody that reads the Bible. He, he forces the devil to put in plain view what's wrong with what he just made up. And the only way you're going to be deceived is if you love not the truth. Right. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So come back to Hebrews 9 and, and look what the Bible says about the Book of Mormon. Verse 17, for a testament is a force after men are dead. Did Jesus die again? Okay. Then what does the Bible say about the Book of Mormon? It is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. As long as Jesus Christ is alive, the Book of Mormon cannot do anything for one lost soul. How about that? Amen. It's a no effect. You don't have to know everything in it. That's all you have to know right there. If it's a testament, who died? And if, if they say Jesus, no, he died to institute the New Testament and said, I'll never die again. So he had nothing to do with the Book of Mormon Amen. other than to tell you that it wasn't about him. All right. Now let's go back to Romans 3. That's just a little extra bonus material there for those of you that give. <laughs> back to Romans 3 and... We're, we're summarizing, we're, we're repeating, but I'm not repeating, the Holy Spirit's repeating. So he wants us to get this. Look at verse 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. Look at verse 26. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness. So one is the uh, manifestation, the other is the declaration in both, both cases of his righteousness righteousness. Now we have looked at this righteousness of God from many, many different angles, and we've got one more that I, I want to look at tonight, and that is the proper response of a sinner when they have this righteousness made manifest to them. And 
I am satisfied that the reason so few people are getting saved today is, is not just because of their overwhelming pride, but because ministers almost universally are promoting and agreeing to that pride rather than preaching against it. They, they have adopted humanism. And, and they call it the gospel because they sprinkle a little Jesus in there. But it's by and large a, a, a humanistic philosophy. Come as you are, dress any way you want to, do anything you want to do. We won't judge you. We won't criticize you. We won't find fault with you. We love you just like you are. And God loves you just like you are. And, and it's, all, it's just a great big lie. But it passes for Christianity because people don't read the Bible. Again, if people read the Bible, they would see through this, this mega church, emerging church movement as easily as they see through the Book of Mormon. But they don't read the Bible. And, and it's not a new thing. Um, but you, you just pull up in the parking lot uh, on a Sunday morning, an average congregation, and, and it could be a Baptist church. And just sit in the parking lot and watch and see how many people get out of a car with a Bible in their hand. Not many. Not many. Same reason I don't come to church and get out of the car with a shovel or a chainsaw in my hand, because I'm not going to use it. They don't bring a Bible to church because they're not going to use it. They don't need it. They'll get half a verse out of context on the overhead screen, and then a preacher will get up and, and tell them how nice they are. And... and He'll have the pre-Mother's Day sermon, and then the week before Mother's Day sermon, and then the Mother's Day sermon, and then the week after Mother's Day, Mother's Day sermon, and we'll just spend a whole month talking about how wonderful it is to have a mother. That's, that's safe. That's easy. Pretty much everybody's got one. <laughs> so, I just want to give you a glimpse, just hop, skip, and jump through the Bible, and show you what happens when somebody really comes face to face with the righteousness of God. Exodus chapter 3. Exodus, well, no, let, let's go back farther. Genesis chapter 3. May as well start the beginning. Genesis chapter 3. Adam had a number of conversations with God in Genesis 2. And seem like they're getting along quite well. But something happened in Genesis 3. Sin entered that man's life. And the Bible says in verse number 8, They heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Verse 10, He said, I heard thy voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Well, he was naked in Genesis 2 and he wasn't afraid. He's unclothed in Genesis 2 and he didn't, didn't run and hide. In fact, he got more clothes on in Genesis 3 than he did in Genesis 2. But the difference is now he's not righteous. And he wants nothing to do with a righteous God. He doesn't want to be seen by a righteous God. He doesn't want to be examined by a righteous God. He doesn't want to have conversation with a righteous God. And I'm telling you, if wicked, ungodly people were going to be confronted with the true God of the Bible, they wouldn't flock to church on a Sunday morning. People want to live in sin? They don't go to a church where the Bible's preached. And as soon as they start getting themselves into some kind of sin, they leave a church where the Bible's preached. You know why? Because they can tolerate an unknown God. They can tolerate a Mormon made-up God. They can tolerate a God of their own imagination. But the real God and their unrighteousness are not compatible, and they know it. You got some sin going on in your life, 
but you still like church, you still like this church, you still like the people here, you better get to an altar and get that sin out of your life or you'll start hating this church and hating this preacher. Because you're not going to live with some sin going on in your life and enjoy God's righteousness being manifest and being declared. People say, well, where's so-and-so? Uh, how, come, how come he left? Where's so-and-so? How come she left? You'll find out in about six months. There's something going on that they weren't comfortable with it going on here. They didn't want to keep going to church because then people might think there's something going on in their life. So they should go to a church where the preacher will never mention anything. It might cause a little unease if something's going on. Yeah. Amen, preacher. That's good preaching. <laughs> I know you're right. I would have said amen, but I was thinking about somebody. <laughs> All right. Gen uh, Exodus chapter 3. Exodus 3. How do people respond when they're brought face to face with the righteousness of God? Uh, Exodus 3, 1, Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Oreb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush, and he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Picture the nation of Israel throughout their history. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord uh, saw that he turned aside to see, God called on him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. How about that? You know what that is? That's a deliverer, that's a lawgiver, that's a man that's going to pastor a million and a half, two million people. That's a man that's going to serve God faithfully for 40 years. That's a man that forsook the treasures of Egypt. That's a man that turned his back on Pharaoh's throne. That's a man that gave up all the wealth and prosperity and power he could have had to suffer affliction with the people of God. Around Pharaoh, Moses A-OK, -okay, never hit his face. Around, around the Egyptian magicians and masters, Moses is doing all right. He never hit his face. Around the, the Hebrew people and the Israelites, Moses is all right. He never hit his face. But when Moses came in the presence of God, he said, I can't be here. Yeah. He's too holy. He's too pure. He's too clean. He's too righteous. I'm going to hide my face from God. You see much of that anywhere? This blasphemous society you live in, these blasphemous churches people go to, I don't, I don't see much understanding of God's righteousness. I have people argue about, against God, argue against the Word of God, criticize preachers that preach the Word of God, make fun of Christians and churches that try to, try to have a higher standard than the world, live by the Scriptures. You know what that is? It's a total absence of, a, a, a total misunderstanding of God's righteousness. Uh, if we're competing, Mo Moses, Moses will win against me every day in every way. I, I couldn't hold a candle to Moses when it comes to serving God, living right, doing something for the Lord. But Moses, when he came face to face with God, he said, I can't, I can't look. I've got to hide. I've got to hide. Mm. Psalm number 40. Psalm number 40. David defeated Goliath. David defeated the Philistines. David, in a very spiritual, very godly manner, uh, defeated Saul. David wrote all these great songs for the Lord. And here's what he says in Psalm 40 and verse number 
10, or, or um, 7. Then said I, Lo, I come, the volume book is written to me. I delight to do thy will, O God, yea, thy laws within my heart. So that's Jesus Christ. We know that from Hebrews 10. I have preached righteousness in the great congregation. Lo, I have not refrained my lips, O Lord, thou knowest. I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart. I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. I have not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth in the great congregation. See that? What's he preaching? God's righteousness. What's he got in his heart? A knowledge of God's righteousness. Verse 11, Withhold not thou thy tender mercies from me, O Lord. Let thy loving kindness and thy truth continually preserve me. For innumerable evils have compassed me about Mine iniquities have taken hold upon me so that I am not able to look up. How about that? They are more than the hairs of mine head, therefore my heart faileth me. David... I, I know, you, you can talk about what David did one day, and you can talk about those six months or a year that David's really messing up. You, you want to you wanna do it this way? Okay, there's two people, you and David, and we're getting to heaven by works, and only one gets in. I bet he wins and you lose. I bet he wins and I lose. You know what he said? When I'm looking at, at a, a giant, I'm the best guy on the field. When I'm looking at the Philistines, I'm the best man on the battlefield. When I'm looking at Saul, no contest. When I look at God's righteousness, I dare not even lift up my eyes. I, I can't even look up. That's a man who said, blessed is he whose sins are forgiven, whose iniquities are covered. He said, I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven. I, God pardoned me. God put away my sin. Well, when I, when I glance his way, whew, he's so righteous, I can't even look. Do you see a lot of that where you work? Do you see a lot of that where you go to school? Do you see a lot of that on Christian TV? you hear a lot of that on Christian radio? I don't. I don't. I see people in church getting mad because they don't get enough recognition getting mad because they don't get treated like the Lord, getting mad because, because something didn't go their way. Why don't you look up? Why don't you look in that burning bush? Why don't you see who's walking through this garden? And you ever get a good understanding of God's righteousness, it'll, it'll humble you. Isaiah chapter 1, or 6, I'm sorry, Isaiah chapter 6. I've been preaching 40 some years. Some of you guys have been preaching that long and longer. I wonder which 66 of my sermons God would put in the Bible. Probably none. Probably none. Written a bunch of books. I've never had the Holy Ghost come to me and say, you know what? That, 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 that book you wrote was so good. I'm going to take Hosea out of the Bible. Nobody reads it anyway. And I'm going to put your book in there. That's not, that's not how, you know it's not happening. Isaiah wrote 66 books of the Bible under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Isaiah is the one prophesied about the virgin birth of Christ about Jesus Christ being the everlasting Father, the mighty God, and the government rest upon His shoulder. Isaiah is the one that wrote that 53rd chapter about the Lamb, all, all these great prophecies. But one time, one time, He got a manifestation, the righteousness of God. Isaiah 6, verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died... I saw the Lord. I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. 
With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. <laughs> when I was growing up, and, and a, a young Christian, there used to be preachers that had national influence. We don't have any of those left. They've either died and, and gone to be with the Lord, or something happened that they lost their influence. But I, I'm telling you, there was a time when saved people everywhere in America were influenced by men like J. Harold Smith, Lester Roloff, Jack Hiles, Jimmy Swaggart. You can like these men or not like these men. I would trade, I, today in a minute, I would trade those men for Joyce Meyer, Joel Osteen, and, and the rest of the wipeouts. Okay, but you just pick your favorite one, uh, maybe, maybe Oliver Green or, or, or um, uh, Jerry Falwell or one of those men. And I, don't, don't, don't write me an email, Jerry Falwell, just stop it already. Let me finish before you blow your mind and, and mom comes down the basement and says, what are you upset about? If you, if you could have walked in to the office of the greatest soul winner, the greatest pastor, the greatest builder of homes for troubled youth in America, there would not have been seraphim flying around that office. Now some of those pastors might have been tempted to hire somebody to work, put on wings and stand around their, their desk, but this is quite a scene. This is the Lord on a throne, and his twain filled the temple. <laughs> no, train, and then, and then these creatures around the throne. And verse number three, one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now think about that. We have a Bible conference, and we, we bring in our, our, our choice, hand-picked Bible expositors, and we introduce, and now Pastor Carlson, pastor of the Golden Plains Baptist Church, one of our favorite preachers, and Brother Rob gets up, takes off his coat, lays it aside, opens his Bible, and said, let me tell you a little story before I start my sermon, and he tells us one of those jokes, and as Brother Rob begins to preach, these beings come down from heaven and begin to encircle him and say, holy, holy Holy, Pastor Carlson. Holy, 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 Pastor Carlson. The whole earth is full of his glory. Are you kidding me? These creatures are not surrounding Isaiah. They're surrounding Isaiah's God. Isaiah talked about him and wrote about him and preached about him and honored him and magnified him, but one day Isaiah got a look. Now I'll tell you, this pride in the pulpit this pride in the pastor's convention and this, this pride among congregations and this pride among the soloist and this pride in the part of the song leader, somebody's not looking at God. Somebody needs to get rid of the mirror. Those, you know those women back in the, when they came out of Egypt, they were so thankful to be redeemed, they turned in their mirrors so they could use their mirrors to build the, uh, the uh, brazen sea outside the tabernacle. Well, that's probably the greatest sacrifice ever been offered. <laughs> anyway, too much looking in the mirror and saying, looking at me, and not enough. So anyway, verse number five. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. What made him say that? For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. That's how people act to understand how righteous God is. And I rarely see anyone acting like that even for a short time. Makes me wonder if we don't have an unknown God today ignorantly worshipped by superstitious people. 
Luke chapter 18. No, no, for Isaiah, I'm sorry, why are you in Isaiah? Isaiah 45, Isaiah 45. Sorry. Isaiah 45. Verse uh, 21, or 20. Assemble yourselves and come. Draw near together. Ye that are escaped of the nations, they have no knowledge that set up the wood of their graven image and pray unto a God that cannot save. You know what the Lord said? They got no brains in their head. They don't know what they're doing. Tell ye, and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together. Who had declared this from ancient time? Who had told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no God beside me, a just God and a Savior. There is none beside me. Look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is none else. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear. You know what that is? That's Acts 17, preview. All men everywhere, you better come and bow before me. You better come and confess I'm the only God. Too much pride, pride in religion, pride in denomination, pride in form of worship, pride in doctrine, pride in service for God, Amen. pride in singing, pride in preaching, pride in soul winning. Yeah. You get your eyes on the Lord, that pride will disappear in a hurry. Because what have any of us done? Come on, think back. Acts 17, what do you say? In him we live, well then you can't take credit for that and move, then you can't take credit for that, and have our being, you can't take credit for that, seeing you give it all life, can't take credit for that, and breath, can't take credit for that, and all things, anything else you got. You can't take credit for any of it. If you don't believe it, watch how fast he can knock you down. Well, I, I, I can take care of myself. Said everybody that's in the hospital now, Set everybody that's in the nursing home now. Set everybody that's in the grave now. Set everybody that's in hell now. <laughs> well, you know, all God's got to do is just, just reach down and, and pinch your, your uh, oxygen cord. <laughs> You're done. Job said, Job said he just, he'd take me away with his stroke. So these guys don't believe the Bible, these scientists and these medical people, they, uh, they have this thing just to take you out in a second and they call it a stroke. Ask them why they call it. I say, well, that's very biblical. You guys going by the Bible like that. What? Huh? <laughs> Word is nigh thee even in thy mouth. They don't even know they're quoting it. All right. Now, take a look in... Uh, Luke 18... We'll take these kind of out of order, but I won't hold that for later. Luke 18, Luke chapter 18, verse 9. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous. See that? They trusted in themselves they were righteous. Can I give you a gospel tract? I'm good. Talk about Jesus? I'm good. You know, you really need to be saved. All of sin comes short of the glory of God. How dare you call me a sinner? There it is, right there. Bible, the Bible's so up to date, it is right on the money. It, it, you know, the more you read this Bible, the more you'll hear it. In every, every day of your life, you'll hear people talking just like the Bible said they would talk saying just what the Bible said they would say. Uh, unsaved people have done as much to convince me that the Bible is the Word of God as saved people have. Because when, when their arguments and their objections and their attitudes and their deeds match exactly what the Word of God says, I'm convinced. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> Lost people make me believe the Bible. Because they, 
They fulfill it every day. Here we go. Two men went up into the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God. <laughs> Interesting wording, isn't it? He stood and prayed thus with himself. God. We had this, this super self-righteous guy in the church I was in when I first got saved. And, and they'd have open prayer times and different people get up to pray. And that man get up to pray. And it was, it was eloquent. It was flowery. It was a lot of Bible verses thrown in. It was, it was just it was, he, it, lovely. And I'd be sitting there and, and Jay Hardy, he'd elbow me. And I'd look at him. He'd elbow me. He'd say, look, look, look. They're stuck on the ceiling. What? what? His prayers are stuck on the ceiling. He said, <laughs> they, they, they weren't getting out of the room. He's, he's just praying to be, be seen of men, you know. <laughs> I've always thought about that. Man, I hope my prayers aren't stuck on the ceiling. I hope they, hope they get out and get to God. Anyway, he said, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are. And he probably wasn't. Unjust. Oh, extortioners unjust, adulterers. Isn't it, isn't it good to be able to say, I'm not an adulterer, I'm not unjust, I, I, I don't commit extortion, isn't that a blessing? Or even as this publican. He just looked around, oh, or like oh, that guy. I'm better than him. Now, now before you Jump on this fella. That's why you get offended at church. Because you're better than the person who said that to you. How, how, how dare you say that to me? Why would it be so awful for me to say that to you? Because, well, I'm better than you. I couldn't possibly take a slight from you. I mean, nobody here tonight, but the people that didn't come tonight, let me, let me say something about them, because no, nobody here tonight would ever do this. You don't walk into a church with a songbook full of songs about God's glory and God's righteousness, and a Bible full of truth about God's glory and God's righteousness, and on a regular basis, do we not walk into the church and look around and say, I thank God I'm not as that man. My family's not like that family. We don't do what they do. I would never wear that. Uh, did, you, did you hear what they watched? You know what that is? It, it's okay for you to do better, but it's not okay for you to think you're better because you're, you're comparing horizontally. You're supposed to be comparing vertically. I'm, glad, I'm, I'm, not, I'm better than I'm not like that publican. Okay. Look what else he did. I fast twice in a week. I fast twice a day. Between breakfast and lunch and lunch and supper. A lot of, a lot of fasts. I do, I do a lot of, lot of fasting, short, short duration. I give tithes of all that I possess. I, I dare say most Christians don't fast twice in a week. And I know most Christians don't tithe all they possess. Ones that tithe just tithe some stuff and not all the stuff. Please keep going. Please don't stop there. Okay. <laughs> just wanted to see who was hanging their head. <laughs> and the publican standing afar off. See that? You know what that is? That's Moses at the burning bush. That's Adam in the garden. Would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven. You know what that is? That's David in Psalm 40. That's Isaiah in Isaiah 6. But smote upon his breast, symbolic of stabbing yourself in the heart. 
saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself should be exalted. How about that? You know what the easy way to humble yourself is? Stop looking at yourself and stop looking at others and look at God. And if you compare yourself to God, it will humble you. If it's the God of the Bible, not a made-up God. Okay, let's compare. We'll close out with this. John 19 and Zechariah 12. John 19 and Zechariah 12. One of the blessings that you provide me with is the privilege of traveling and preaching in so many different churches. And it really is true that congregations uh, tend to take on the, the personality of the pastor, which means you're all crazy. Um, <laughs> but there are churches that are very, very, very emotional. There are some churches, when they're going down through the prayer request, people are sobbing and crying and coming and throwing themselves on the altar. And then there's churches you can preach your heart out, and if, if somebody gets really radical, they might nod their head during the sermon. It's just, and there's not a right and a wrong to it. So I don't try to fish for emotional responses, and I don't try to fish for people to come to the altar, and there's ways you can work it, you know, and, and to get people to come, but, the, but that's, my purpose is long term. Uh, I think somebody gets saved in one church service, I think somebody can repent and deal with something in life in one church service, but you're going to live for the Lord, you're going to have to come three times a week for years. Because every time you make a little progress, that world's going to push you back. And a little more progress, that world's going to push you back. It's going to take a lot of preaching, a lot of singing, a lot of fellowship to get anywhere yes, sir. in a Christian life. So, so we're not trying to have this one dramatic big thing. But here's, the, here's, the, here's the, the negative side of that. In the last several weeks, we have been through... The most, I'm not, I'm not talking about my delivery, I'm talking about the material. We've been through the most incredible truths about the Son of God shedding His blood so God could redeem us and give us everlasting life. And we got a church full of people who take that and process it intellectually and factually and don't have any emotional response to it at all. That's not good. It shouldn't just be cold, dry knowledge. It shouldn't just be references jotted down in the margin of my Bible to show somebody when I'm witnessing someday. I mean, it ought to have some effect upon our heart and our emotions and our soul when we consider what Christ has done for us. And if we're not careful, we're going to get heady and high-minded and, and not enough heart and too much head and we're going to tip over and fall. Now, let, me show you, let me show you a good example of what I'm talking about. Here's the fact of the matter. The fact of the matter. John 19 verse 32. Then came the soldiers and brake the legs of the first and the other which was crucified with him. When they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they brake not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith true, that ye might believe, for these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled, the bone of him should not be broken. And again another scripture saith, they shall look on him whom they pierced. You know what we do with that? We note 
that the Bible is true and one of the proofs the Bible is true is fulfilled prophecy and what was written in the Old Testament came to pass in the New Testament. Look right there, it proves that Jesus is the promised Messiah and we got all the factual information. Because we study the Bible. Let's read the prophecy. Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him. As one mourneth for his only son. And shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Can I, can I say this not to you, not about you, to us and about us. We can go through months of preaching and teaching on the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and nothing resembling mourning arise in any of our hearts. It's a really, really sad thing when a man like Tom Melton dies and we were sad. It's a really, really sad thing. We, we've had all kinds of funerals around here and loss around here and, and, and we weep and we... It's a really, really sad thing that God's Son was pierced for our sins. And if we've got a flaw, and we do, and if we've got a, a danger point, and we do, it's that this Bible will become 100% intellectual and 0% emotional, and it'll affect our head, but it'll never affect our heart. And you can know all about your wife and walk out on her. Or you can love your wife and you'll be true to her till you die. And you can know all about what Jesus did and walk away from him. If you love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, you'll stay true to him to the end. Let's, let's be careful that we're not, getting, oh, that's a good verse. That's a good one. That's a good cross-reference. Yeah, that, I hadn't seen that one. Yeah, that Isaiah. And, okay, that's all good. But when Adam and the Lord came face to face, there was some emotion there. Moses and the Lord came face to face, there was some emotion there. When David and Isaiah came face to face with the Lord, there's some emotion there. When they looked on him whom they pierced, there was some emotion there. Let's don't become as dead and cold and dry as the idols carved with people's hands. I don't want to be just some sort of mechanical, robotic Christian spouting verses and handing out tracts and it doesn't touch me down here that Christ suffered like he did. It's humbling. Humbling. Get that revelation, that declaration of God's righteousness. Okay, so I'm not, we're not going to play a sad song and come up here and come on, try to make yourself cry. I, I'm, just, I'm just telling you, don't get so anti-charismatic and anti contemporary, that you're just cold, dead, dry, formal, emotionless creatures. Man, what Jesus did, he said, boy, if, my, if one of my loved ones died, one of your loved ones did die for your sins. Some, something to think about, something to ponder. Amen. All right, Father, thank you for the Bible. Please, Lord, please, let us learn the truth and live the truth. Please, God, may we be affected by the truth in some way. Keep our hearts from getting hard and cold and dry, indifferent. Please, Father, we pray in Jesus' name.
Amen. Amen. All right, we've got some building news for you on Sunday, so I'll give you something to look forward to besides seeing each other. Amen. You dismiss. Good night.